so we're in Mark chapter 5. We are in verse 40 because last time, now this would be three Wednesdays ago, uh, I had ended in verse 39 of Mark chapter 5. Let me just read from 30, uh, it's 39. So let me read from 35 down, okay? Would you just follow with me? I'm going to read Mark 5 beginning at verse 35. It says, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Oh, why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion. People weeping and wailing loudly, verse 39. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Verse 40, and they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumai, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Yeah. Like they're just going to sit there and say, okay, Lord, thanks for raising our child from the dead. We're cool. Let's go eat. Uh, that would be pretty exciting stuff. And a story that you would think was going to end sadly. What does Jesus do to those stories, beloved of Christ? Always ends them. No matter what the end is to us, the end to the individual is always joyful. Isn't that what the Bible teaches us? And this is such a great it's a, it's a great example of something like that happened. Of course, it is this incredible miracle beginning there in verse 35 where Jesus was making his way back to the, to the man's house who had come and begged Jesus to come, saying that my daughter is dying and just wanted to see Jesus come and, and, and heal her, raise her, do whatever he needed to do to bring her back to good health. Now, verse 40 is where we would pick up. It says, <clears throat> and they laughed at him. Now, who were they? Now, these were professional mourners. In those days, it was very common that in a funeral procession or a time of mourning, people would ha uh, hire professional mourners to come and basically to make a lot of noise. The idea was that the more noise, the louder that the ceremony or the funeral, I should say, was, the more love, the more this family cared. In fact, the wealthier families had more mourners. And it always seemed like they just loved their kids more. Um, and oh, by the way, somebody asked, you know, why even go there? I'll tell you some more background to it. Now, in Jewish culture, in Jewish, Sarah, uh, Jewish culture, bodies, once dead, were quickly wrapped and prepared for burial. In fact, it would be done by the evening time. So you just figure that when a person dies, the ceremony, the morning time, has to happen very quickly. And because of that, they have to draw as many people as they can, and they want to make sure it's known that we love this person. And so they actually hired people to come and sort of fill in the gaps. So that's why they had professionals at their funerals. But the problem was that these guys are shedding tears one moment, and then what? The next moment, they're dying with laughter. They're, they're, they're laughing at at Jesus for the stuff he's saying, you know, and, and those guys are being paid by this poor, saddened family. And he tells them, you know what? Get out of here. Like, who do you think you are? <laughs> it's more like, uh, do you know who I am? But that's not what Jesus does here. Not at all. 
He just says, wait a minute. We have another way of looking at things because I'm God. And one of the things I do is I look at things differently than you do. And that is just one of the most comforting thoughts that came to my heart when I was reading this story. Praise you, God, that you see stuff unlike I see stuff. Because when we do, you guys adopt the perspective of heaven. It changes things. Always remember the perspective of heaven. That's how God sees us. He's got a plan. He knows what's coming for you. He knows what's coming in whatever circumstance. And uh, you know what? If there are some professional mourners, he's the kind of God who could say, you know what? Be quiet. Because I got something else going on here. So it says here that Jesus basically, he put them outside. If you, again, you guys know I like to look at the original language. If you look at the original language here, it says, but he put them uh, outside. It's, the, the implication is that some sort of force had to be used. It's like, he doesn't just kind of escort, hey, would you guys come with me so that we could go outside now? It basically says, these guys, they were out of there. And it was because Jesus did something to get them out of there. He took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. The word there is procession. I want you to think about the, again, you guys, at this moment, I want, here's what I'm trying to do is contrast the earthly or worldly perspective versus the heavenly one or God's plan. So, it's a procession through the home. The implication is, uh, what it implies is that they didn't just walk from outside to the inside and saw the body there. For whatever reason, Jesus had to escort mom and dad through some passageway or through some broad room so that there was time for them to consider what was happening before they actually went to go do whatever needed to be done. And I thought that was also pretty, it's something to, to ponder. This is the worst thing that a parent could possibly consider the death of their child. And for whatever reason, the Lord allowed it so that this would be the way it took place. He would cast these people out here, but it would be such that he would still need to, just he and his disciples, take mom and dad through and walk to wherever they needed to go and finally get to the girl. What, what was that? What was that about? Did they just need to be with Jesus? That's kind of the way I'm picturing it. Do you just, even when you have to mourn at your, at the worst even when something before you is at its worst, you know what Jesus wants to do with you? He just wants to hang with you. He just wants to be with you. That's the way I see it. Like they needed to feel his grip. I don't know. They needed to see how much he cared before they got to that area where it would just draw them to further weeping. But it says that it was a procession to where the little girl was. They finally get to this place and it says what next? Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talithi kumai, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. Now the reason you have a translation is because this was spoken in Aramaic. And well, that was sort of the language of that, of that region, of that area. And so the readers of this text wouldn't necessarily know Aramaic so much as they would know straight whole Greek. And so when it was written here, uh, translation was given as well. That's why it says, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. It's, um, it's what you would call a, diminu a diminutive. If you know what that means, it's a, it's a, it's a tender heart-to-heart -heart address. Uh, actually, literally, if you wanted to translate it, this is what I think it would be. Sweetheart. Sweetheart, I say to you, arise. Can you just even imagine that? This is God, the creator of the universe, going to a little girl, actually holding her hand and saying, sweetheart, 
with his mother and father there, uh, with her mother and father there. So there he is hand in hand, tender and, 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 and loving. So he, he's been tender and loving to mom and dad as they've walked the procession. And now he comes to her straight and he is as tender as he could possibly be. And that's when it says the, the amazing happened. Uh, in Luke, it says that her spirit returned and at once she got up. Verse 42, it says, and immediately the girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years of age and they were immediately overcome with amazement. I think we got a classic piece of art. This is from the 1500s. I just thought it was interesting the way art. I, I look at, you know, when I'm doing my studies too, I'll usually type in like a text area and look at the artwork that pops up. And so this is, this was one of those. I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty incredible. If you could just picture that that's what it looked like. They would have had to make their, make their way from the street through some sort of a courtyard and finally get to where the girl is. Look, this is just some artist rendition. Nevertheless, so Luke said her spirit returned to her. Uh, uh, Mark says here, immediately the girl got up. I think it's interesting that Luke says it the way he does because have you ever heard those who insist that the Bible teaches a concept known as soul sleep? Soul sleep is the idea where when your body ceases, when you die, the spirit that is within it, because we are, of course, spiritual creatures first and foremost, that it sort of, I don't know, hibernates or something. Basically, literally goes to sleep and doesn't leave until the resurrection, when Jesus comes. And, you know, it's... I can just say Luke alone uh, makes it clear that that surely isn't the case as he says her spirit returned to her. Uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, to be absent with, from the body is what? To be present with the Lord. I remember that story of Elijah. Remember from, from uh, 1 Kings? In, in 1 Kings uh, 17, it says that uh, he was... You know, he was leaning over a boy, a, a, dead, a dead boy, and he prayed that the Lord would revive this boy. And his prayer was, the Lord heard Elijah's prayer and his soul came back into him and he lived. Just, there's a whole bunch of examples where the idea of soul sleep certainly isn't a biblical one. But this would be one of them where we are in the book of Mark. So she wasn't in soul sleep. Uh, she was dead. Uh, the creator of the universe takes her by the hand and calls her sweetheart. Her spirit comes back into her and she, she rises. I, I remember hearing a pastor talk about this years and years ago and he was talking the same thing. Basically, her spirit, she would have been in the presence of the Lord at that time because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And when Jesus said, Talitha Kumai, he's like, did, did the halls of heaven echo with those words from Jesus? And everybody stopped, all the angels, all the spirits just stopped and said, oh. and this little girl realized that the call was to her. It's not mind boggling to think that that's kind of something that could have been. And so finally, though, of course, back she comes. And verse 43, then again, and he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. <laughs> I, I think the first thing he said was, go get your money back from those so-called mourners over there. <laughs> then get something to eat. But... But really, you know what struck me here was Jesus' ministry. Think about this, you guys, okay? So Jesus' ministry, he's through four gospels that we have in the Bible. We say approximately three years, give or take. In all of his recorded miracles, the one that he did the least, at least recorded, 
was raising people from the dead. Did you know, uh, you know what the, the most is, by the way, if you want to take a rough count? Healing the blind. That's number one on his list. So he, he, he raises people from the dead a total of three times. Three times. There was this one here, the young girl, in Luke chapter 7, where Jesus goes to Nain and he raises the widow's son. And then in the small town of Bethany, remember Lazarus? That was four days he waited until he finally got there and said, yo, Lazarus, come out. Um, interesting kind of, uh, what's the similarity? I was thinking, what is a similarity? If he only did it three times and these are the three, what about this? He raised an only daughter. He raised an only son. And he raised an only brother. And then I thought about it in this, in this sense. Um, soon, the only son of God would be raised from the dead. It's, it's kind of cool the way stuff just, just works out. I know by, by no accident. Uh, why did Jesus raise those three? In other words, they're dead. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Why bring them back? You know, was it for their sake? You know, when the little girl is roaming the halls of heaven, so to speak, is it like for her benefit that she is drawn back to the earth to continue living a life as a human being? Of course not. Uh, who'd want to come back from bliss to heartache? <laughs> who'd want to who'd come back from a place where Jesus himself roamed, where God the Father was on the throne versus that place where there's heartache and sadness, where there's pain and suffering, where my kids would go their school and homework, why would anybody want to come back to a place like this when there's heaven? And then, of course, you answer the question, well, Jesus, being who he was, always loving and caring for the others, did it for those around those people, with Lazarus, with the widow's son, and, of course, here with this sweetheart, with mom and dad whom he had taken through on some little mini procession. Uh, the, the girl came back to life so that the heartbroken parents could witness his power. Um, so that the disciples, the three guys there could go like this. <laughs> so that the entire, you know, like I said, they're not going to keep their lips shut, right? so that the whole town could know, so that it would spread all over. Do you know what this Jesus could do? He brought back this little girl, and you should have seen how he did it. He didn't just be like, okay, guy, all right, fine, the girl's going to live. You should have seen the love and the compassion, the, the, the connection. This isn't just some magic man. This is, he's a savior. This is, this is a Messiah. This is God himself, the God of love, demonstrating love in a way that only God could demonstrate it. This is what happened every time, you guys. Whenever Jesus rose, or when he um, raised people from the dead, one of the key words in, you know, those in those scenes, what about hope? Would that be a key word? Absolutely. There would be hope. Um, it would certainly build the faith. You know, uh, have, you've heard of William Tennant from the 1600s, 1700s. He was who you'd call the kind of, he started the, the, um, the great uh, Reformation. Couldn't think about that. Couldn't think of that one. But anyway... The story goes that one of his sons, William Tennant Jr., had been, you know, had been with him. He was going around. Tennant Sr. 
had been teaching and he had been preaching and getting. One of the big things Tennant did was he got other preachers ready to preach. But anyway, so he had been on one of his little tours and found out that his boy, has, uh, Tennant Jr., died. And the story goes that his son was dead for a total of three days. And all the while, people were faithfully praying to God that he would be brought back to life. Um, he went on to describe what he had seen. His son raised back to life. After three days of prayer, heart stopped. He was dead. God restored this young man's life. When the boy rose from the dead, uh, Tenet Jr. then, the first thing he did was describe where he had been and what he had seen. Here are some key words out of his story. He, the glory and the majesty were beyond description. The beauty beyond description. But he said that a voice, he had heard a voice coming from the center of the place that he was. He couldn't see the face. But this voice told him, it's not yet for you to stay here. And that's when he was drawn back from heaven and back into his body where the people around him, tenant of course, and the family saw. And it was after that point when the Great Reformation started. It was one of those things where you guys, it wasn't just an arbitrary act. There was this, there was this purpose behind it. You know, like I said, the girl, or the disciples saw the girl. The town heard about the girl. You and I heard about the girl because we saw, saw it right here in the story. But that's how a revival happened. That's how the great revival happened. I said, the, if I said the, the Reformation or whatever, I meant the Great Awakening. I don't know what I, what I said, but that's what I meant. Um, but it was one of those, it was one of the revivals. And what you and I are to do, what you and I, I this is kind of the way we, we respond to this, okay? We read the stories and in the midst of reading the story, we let that ignite our hearts. Here's what I mean by that. Because oftentimes what, not oftentimes, sometimes what people will do is read the miracles of the Bible, right? And they'll, and they'll say, praise the Lord. Oh, that was so great. Awesome. But we don't let a fire really ignite until we sort of experience that miracle. And I want to encourage you guys that Jesus very intentionally put it in the book of Mark put it in the book of Luke, that we would be able to share in the almost the, the hysteria of faith that would have arisen from this girl's resurrection. Um, there were millions who were affected by the Great Awakening. But I can tell you that nearly none of the millions experienced any personal resurrection in their families, right? But there was a fire that was lit by what had happened here. Christian, I just want to encourage you, when you read your Bibles, it can get lost. The miraculous power of our God can get kind of lost. And we just go, oh, yeah, that was when Jesus raised a girl from the dead. <laughs> Next. These are, these are to capture and transform us like it captured and transformed men like William Tennant. So there they were. It was done. And so his, his work was done. His purpose there had been fulfilled. Now we, we go on, beloved, to, to um, Mark chapter 6. It says this. He went away from there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Just, just right there. A separate occasion back in Luke chapter 4, he'd come to this same synagogue. Do you remember this story where it says that he opened the scriptures and he read from the book of Isaiah. And then he said to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled right there in your, see or in your hearing. So this is the second time now that we're talking about this particular synagogue. Okay, in Nazareth. It says, many who heard him were astonished saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? 
How are such mighty works done by his hands? Verse 3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Oh, brother. <laughs> please. Don't you just want to go, please? You took offense at him? Do you know who he is? Um, what does the saying go? Familiarity breeds contempt. I had that, something like it. These people knew Jesus. They knew Jesus. You know, so well that they actually didn't know Jesus. Um, he grew up, remember the carpenter. In fact, it has the article the, T-H-E, before carpenter. Sort of indicates to me that he was the man when it came to carpentry work. You need a wall moved or a door cut in or something, you call Jesus. So he was the man. They all knew this Jesus, but they're like, wait a minute, isn't this the, the carpenter guy? Oh, wh what's up? Doesn't he have a bunch of brothers and sisters? People say he probably had a total of seven, maybe. But didn't he have a bunch of brothers and, and sisters? Isn't he the kid who, you know, used to like hang out with his dad? And they're not going to take it. They're not going to buy it. They're not going to, they're not going to allow it for him to do what he's doing. That's like insulting their intelligence. Jesus, who do you think you are, man? It says in verse four, and Jesus said to them, oh, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. Look at this one. It's called Jesus is re rejected at Nazareth. Uh, it's a little tough to see. <laughs> so I, I think Missy asked me, so are they about to push him off the rocks? Because like I'm thinking the same thing. Are they about to do that? But it's not in the Bible anywhere, so, so no. But that's, the, that's kind of the thing that came to this artist's mind. Jesus says um, several times during his ministry, a prophet is not without, I think there's three recorded times. A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives, and in his own household. I can't, I can't catch a break from people who think they know me. <laughs> I was thinking about my high school reunion. Uh, let's see, 20-year high school reunion. I graduated, I was class of 89, so let's see, 20-year reunion was 2009, so it was Prescott High School, so it was right here in Prescott. And I remember Missy and I going to the, to the, um, to the reunion and, you know, seeing all the people, you remember how that is. You see the people that you liked and you definitely didn't like and the people in between. I was one of the, uh, you're going to be shocked, but I was one of those nerds in high school. I know you guys are like, no way. You must've been a jock. You must've been the guy. You must've been all things to all people. No, no. I was one of those geeky nerds. And, and so anyway, so I remember going up to one of these girls. I had known her since fourth grade at Miller Valley School. And she asked me, she's like, yeah, Raj, you know, how's it going? What, you know, what are you up to? And I remember, you know, kind of answering and I said, uh, yeah, you know what? I'm the senior pastor over at Calvary Chapel of Prescott over there on, on Highway 89. Like her jaw literally dropped to the ground. And she, like she didn't want to be there when I told her this, you know, she'd be, she'd expected me to like say I was an engineer, you know, or a doctor. Or I owned a couple of 7-Elevens or something <laughs> where, you know, like it seemed like I was successful or something. It's like, she's like oh, a, a pastor. <clears throat> uh, that's really nice. <laughs> uh, uh, God, uh, God bless you. <laughs> But, but, you know, the, it was kind of that scene in the reunion. Nobody thought that this kid would be a pastor. No, no, I was, I was like one of the staunch atheists of the school. So to think that I was going to be a Christian, I was the guy who'd always insult the Christians first. And 
they're hearing me and they're, all these jaws are on the floor as I go through the room, you know? Everybody can't believe what has happened to me because they think they know me. No, got a lot of those, no, no, come on, no. You ever had that kind of stuff happen to you, oh Christian? I know you have. What about with the family? Oh, I remember that. I loved them and I, I wanted to tell them all about Jesus, mom and dad and uncle and auntie and cousin. I wanted you to know that I, got, I fell in love with Jesus and I'm saved and I'm, and so I, I, you know, of course I hand them their Hindi Bibles because I bought Bibles in their language just for them. I'm like, you know, what is this? What, what, what is this? And, and I explain it to them. I said, you know what? This is a, it's a Bible. That's what I now read. And that's kind of what I base my life on. And now this is going to be easy for you to do the same thing. <laughs> I, I think those Bibles turn out to be kindling for like fires. You know what I mean? I don't think anybody actually opened one up and read it. They thought they knew me and they weren't really willing to listen to the new me and hear what it was that I had to say. And it was, it was a bummer, huh? Because I know you've had the family experiences as well. It's thinking about something Paul said. Okay, it won't be on the screen, but it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Listen to what he says to the Corinthian church in verses 16 and 17. He goes, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You know what Paul is saying? He's saying, when you, beloved of Christ, receive Christ, in essence, you get a new pair of glasses. You get this pair of glasses that can like penetrate right through to the heart and see the inner man. You're able to see things from a spiritual perspective first, and then the human perspective sort of falls on top of that. But Paul implies, therefore, that if you don't have Christ, you don't have these glasses. And so you can't tell, you can't see. So I, if I would have walked up to one of you and said, hi, my name is Raj, and I'm a Christian, you would have absolutely said, dude, you're right, you are. I didn't mean that to be so loud. Dude, you're right, you are, and so am I. And I'd have been, you know what? You're right, you are. But when it's not that way, then the people can't see them. When you're indwelt by the Spirit, that's kind of what I mean when I say your pair of glasses. When you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, which every Christian is, God gives you this discernment. He gives you the spiritual filter. And I think that's what you see not there in that Nazareth synagogue. That's what you see not there at my high school reunion. That's what you see not there when I go and I practically weep, hoping that my family will listen and, and get it. I think that's what's not there. But it is here. And you've wept. I'm looking at some of you. You've already told me your stories. I was trying to tell my son, and he doesn't want to have anything to do with me. I don't, we text every two years because I'm a Christian, and he's off doing his own thing. I know. But, but nevertheless, would you please notice this? At least Jesus went. At least Jesus went. He knew that he was going to be the object of this sort of criticism he knew he was going to be the object of those who would actually have absolute scorn and practically would throw him off the rocks. And yet he did it anyway. Because that's our call, right? Are we supposed to let any sort of fear keep us from doing it or even the possibility of rejection? Because how many times has that held you back? Rejection. If I say this, they're going to say that, and that's the end. Oh, no. Rejection. Nevertheless, we are followers, not of our flesh, not of our emotion. We are followers of our Christ, Jesus. And when you are a Christ follower, you know what? Follow Christ all the way. 
Sometimes we got to take it from our families and sometimes we got to take it from our friends and we got to take it from all the other people. But you know what? You are a Christ follower, Christian. And this is, this is what we do. Jesus, in fact, said to his disciples, look, John 15, verse 20. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Translation, be a Christ follower no matter what. Oh, by the way, I'm Christ. That's kind of what that says. You know, we can expect it. Yeah, it's going to happen. It, even our town, you know, we have an awesome town. We're always ranked somewhere high on, you know, best places to live or top retirement communities, all these other stuff. Half of us are more from, are back here from Southern California. You know, I never even want to go back there ever again. But this is one of those places where people are nice, they say. People will smile here, they say. You know, you ask Everton. Everton, uh, he, he and Natasha, his wife, they're like, you know, people smiled at us. Because, you know, they're from Southern California. It's like, whoa, what are you, well, you're smiling at me? Like, are you smiling at somebody else? This is that kind of town. But you know what happens when you share the things of Christ? Oftentimes, a smile goes away, doesn't it? Huh? Oftentimes, it seems like Prescott is supposed to be ranked down at the bottom, not at the top, because of the way they might respond to you. Nevertheless, I just want us to, again, be re reiterate in our own hearts and minds, it's going to happen, so what? We are Christ followers. Verse 5. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Oh, what a bummer. Come on. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Let me tell you the implication I think I see here, okay? Sort of the context. I think there's an equivalent context to Matthew chapter 23, um, how, how, uh, People wouldn't come to Jesus, okay? There were Jesus was there to be, to, for people to approach, right? Did Jesus never turn people away when they approached him. He was there for people to be drawn to him. But there were so many times when they weren't, when they rejected him, just like these people here. What happens then? Well, you know what? Stuff happens. Uh, Matthew chapter 23, verses 37, 8, and 9 you remember this is where Jesus weeps over his city, Jerusalem? Because, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing? See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's, it's so sad. Huh? Just have the heart of Jesus right there, okay? Let's say you are Jesus. Here's what you, you've been utterly, passionately rejected by the people you love, by the city that you love. This is Jerusalem. This is like the capital of the Holy Land. This is the capital right here. And he looks at all the people and they've all turned him down. He says, what have you done? And the context here is, do you know what I would have done for you? All you needed to do, I was right there. I was in the streets. I was in the villages nearby. All you had to do at any time was just approach me in faith. And do you know what I would have done for you? What I wanted to do for you? And here's his people in Nazareth, right? Like little Prescott kind of a thing. And, and I think the same thing. He's probably looking at this crowd going, do you know what I would have done for you? Do you know all that you had to do was come to me and ask? That, that's what I wanted to do. But instead, they just said, forget you, carpenter. Out of here, man. You know, sometimes Jesus, um, 
wants you and I, not sometimes, I shouldn't say sometimes, all the time. Your life in Christ is oftentimes based upon you seeking after Jesus. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, that the, the life you live the, th the blessings you experience. Let's see, how else would we say it? Perhaps the miracles that you would experience. Um, just a, an all-encompassing all blessed life in Christ is oftentimes based on how it is you approach Jesus in your life as a Christian. Now, of course, not all the time. I mean, he's God. You know, he can override us. He can look past our emotions sometimes or the things we do. And he does whatever he wants to do. But you know, I mean, here, here's an example. What about the paralytic? Remember who was lowered through, through the ceiling? Remember that? Through the roof? I, I was remembering how the paralytic had no faith. It was the four guys, who, his friends, who dropped him through. <laughs> Not dropped him, lowered him through. Whoa! <laughs> Good thing he couldn't get hurt any worse. But so, so there he is. And Jesus doesn't care that the guy doesn't have faith. Jesus, he honors their faith. So yeah, Jesus can override us personally and still bless us. God can still do that sort of a thing because he is the sovereign God. Nevertheless, he wants you to not reject him. Nevertheless, he wants you to have sort of a proactive relationship with him, not a reactive relationship. And this can get a little dangerous, Christians. We live comfortably. It's a, it's a comfy, comfy culture we live in. Yeah, I know, got a couple of bumps and hiccups here and there. But it's, it's, it, this is paradise compared to about 90% of the world's population. And unfortunately, what this sort of a lifestyle does is it draws people to reactivity rather than proactivity. And Jesus has so much work to do in his people. And people that Jesus wants to work through, they're not supposed to be reactive. They are supposed to be seekers. That's what you and I are supposed to be in our lives in Christ. How have you been seeking the Lord as of late? Let's just say you were supposed to write down, if I said, okay, so tell me, what is it that you've been going after God for? What has been very consistent? What do you do? Do you serve in some place because you just want to get better at that service? Do you pray for something because you want to see something really come to fruition? What do you do? What do you do? Because unfortunately, there are some people who go, well, let's see. I prayed that that cop didn't see me speeding. And I prayed, uh, I had a little pain in my side the other day. I kind of prayed for that to go away. You know, it's just, you just get that stuff. I realize that the Lord is so keen, like he did with Jerusalem and, and Nazareth, saying, hey, Raj, do you know what I want to do through you? Do you know what I want to do to you? I want to uh, encourage you guys to this, okay, exhort you. Uh, Evaluate yourself before the Lord. Lord, have I become a reactor or am I proactive in my, in my faith with you? What does a day look like for you? How often do you spend your time with the Lord? What about devotions? What about reading the Bible? Sometimes people say, I just don't have time, so I turn the, you know, the Bluetooth on in my car and I listen to some Devo come over the, the airwaves. And that's kind of what they say, well, at least I got my Devo time in. That's not the, the life that we're called to live. We're supposed to, you know, when Nate, when Nate called yesterday, he said, hey, Raj, dude, I'm just not feeling too well. Think something's going on. You know what? Praise God that Missy and I, we just happened to be there and we just held each other's hands and we just prayed for him right there. That's, that's like unusual for, not unusual. I was just really glad that the Holy Spirit led us to doing that. Because it sure would have been easy to say, okay, dude, I'll, I'll be praying for you. And then maybe in my devos this morning, I would have prayed for him. But it was a lot, a lot better than that, okay? Huge lesson here. 
Jesus' heart was broken. Let's not break his heart. Let's get him excited to be his. That's like, well, how exciting would Jerusalem have been? Okay, anyway, we got to move on here. It says in verse 6, okay? It says something that just blew me away. I, I never gripped it until I studied it. It says here just the first few words. It says, and he marveled. Just stop there at the word marveled. This is God. This is God the creator. And he was marveled. That basically means stunned to the point of shock. Like taken aback to the point of being shocked. How do you shock God? I, I didn't really know that you could shock God. But apparently they could shock God. That's what they did. You know what it was that shocked him? What was it? Was it shocking that, wow, their bodies were put together with all the micro little DNA and all the little things came together? Wow, that's shocking. I can't believe it. Did he look up at the sky one day and say, whoa, look, that's life comes from that sky. Oh, and it comes down to here. And was he shocked? It says that he was shocked. He was, he marveled because of their unbelief. Okay, I want you to keep that in mind because listen to this. Only one other time in the whole Bible that it says that God was shocked like this. You know what? One other time. Uh, Matthew chapter eight. You don't have to turn there. I'll give you the story. So there was a centurion. Remember the story of the centurion? There was a centurion there and he asks Jesus, he approaches Jesus, and what he wants Jesus to do is to heal his servant back home. And Jesus basically agreed. And so Jesus was essentially like, okay, you know, let's go back to your house, and I'll go and heal your servant. But the centurion, it says, stopped him, and he said, Lord, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant will be healed. Here's like the best part, you guys, verse 9. He goes, Listen carefully. For I too, T double O, for I also am a man under authority. I say to one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does that. Jesus, you just say to my servant, be healed from here, and he'll be healed. That's my paraphrase. It says, Jesus marveled. That's the only other time it uses that term marveled. You know what he marvels at? The centurion's belief. What shocked the God of this universe was unbelief, and what shocked the God of this universe was belief. To the core, that's what God cares about for you and for me. Does he care about how you do stuff first and foremost? Of course not. And don't get down on yourself when you just don't quite do it the right way. You know what God cares about? Do you have faith? Because that's what's going to shock your God and make him say, then it is going to be finished, man. Because that's what he did. He heals, the, it says, the centurion's uh, servant gets healed. And this is what, this is what we're, we're, supposed to, uh, we're supposed to be driven by is faith and not works. It's supposed to make us free like we're teaching on Sunday and not make us feel like we're under any yoke. He cares about our faith. It marveled him that somebody didn't believe and it marveled him that somebody did believe. But I'm going to take you one step further. And that's where I said, focus on the word to, remember? Also, Jesus, he saw in, is what I see here, that 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 Jesus' true marvel in the centurion's faith was this, that the centurion's faith was not in Jesus' power to do a healing. It was in Jesus' identity as God the Son. Okay, listen, I'm going to give you some, some stuff to, to go with this. I want you to know this because some people might ask, or maybe it's just for you like me to be amazed at. So the centurion goes, like this, he goes, for I too am a man under authority, for I also. Okay, here's par my paraphrase. Jesus, I get you. He goes, I give orders. He goes, I tell people what to do, and they do it. And here's why they do it. Because I get my authority from somebody even greater than I. 
Caesar. When a centurion, you know, centurion is chosen by Caesar. When he says, do something, you do it. Because Mr. Roman uh, leader emperor is backing up the words of this centurion. So if he tells you go, you say, yes, sir. Centurion says to Jesus, I realize that anything you say is going to come to pass because there is one even greater than you. Now, remember, we're speaking spiritually here, who sort of will back up your words. He understood that this was Jesus, the son of God. He said, you as I speak on behalf of somebody of great power and great authority, and therefore when you speak, it'll get done. And I can actually ask you to heal my dying servant who's a long distance away. This is what Jesus actually marveled at. So yeah, it was faith, but it was a deep, deep, genuine faith. And this guy's a Gentile. Remember that? He, G Jesus says, you know, nobody in all of Israel believes like this man. Jesus is like, how come my own people don't know who I am? My own people don't believe in me. But look at this man. He's a warrior of, of, of Caesar's. And he gets it. And it says, Jesus marveled at his belief. Isn't that just too cool? That's what the Lord cares about for you, beloved. You just believe in who Jesus is. Everything else will follow. You go after your Lord hard because he is God the Son and the Son of God and he will do great things through you. He healed the servant, it says. Done. Verse 6, and he went out about among the villages teaching. So they were unbelievers. Did Jesus work in them? Nope. He said, okay, then I'm off. So he leaves his hometown, verse 7, and he called the 12 and he began to send them and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Little Greek here too. <laughs> Pretty fascinating. So send, okay, send. It says, and he called the 12 and began to send. That's um, apostello, where we get the word apostle. Apostle means one sent. So Jesus sends these out by his commission Oh, disciples of Christ who are also sent from him. Um, when Jesus rose from the dead, he went to the men and he told them to share the gospel. And he told them to make disciples. All authority, this is Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Well, what do you know? The centurion got it right. All authority in heaven and on earth had been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So in that, in that quote is the word authority. In Mark chapter 6, verse 7 is the word authority. Some of your Bibles might say power. And uh, the Greek word there is not dunamis. Because a lot of times we'll say, wow, we got the power of God. That's the dunamis, the Holy Spirit power, right? From Acts chapter 1, when it says the Holy Spirit came upon them, that's that dunamis dynamite, man, we can go get them kind of power. This is a different one known as exousia. And the reason what's so compelling about this is it means a power that's right to ownership is the king's, okay? It means the right to its ownership is the king. And what the king does is he allows or he bequeaths that right to one of his servants. It's, it's, it's different because in you and I, dearly beloved of Christ, it's the dunamis power. It's the Holy Spirit in us. And this exousia power, it's Jesus saying, you know what? I'm going to continually kind of be your fuel. And I'm just going to kind of, I'm just going to kind of keep on keeping on. The, the, the verb is, um, it's uh, imperfect. And imperfect means continual. You know, it's not one time and it's done. It's imperfect means it's got to go on and on and on and on. That's what the imperfect verb does. And he goes, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the power that you need. And oh, by the way, the power is going to keep coming. As you need it, don't worry, I'm supplying it. Now, why does he do that? Because the king gets exclusive right to this power. Um, it's kind of like it has to be done that way. But what I just think is so cool is that Jesus made sure to supply even back then when that dunamis power of the Holy Spirit wasn't available yet, he still made sure that if I give you a task, I'm going to give you everything you need to accomplish the task. 
That's what's so astounding by the way Jesus kind of says, okay, go. It says he charged them to take nothing. This is verse 8. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, no coolers with soda, no Gatorade, no granola mix, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. Hmm. About a year from now, Jesus is going to die on the cross, give or take. And he would be sending his men to go and make disciples. Some of his men would become missionaries. Some of his men would flee for their lives because people wanted to kill them. And what I see Jesus doing here, you guys, is training his people to be his people. Remember we talked about being Christ followers? When I think Jesus says, don't take this, don't take that, don't take the other thing, I think what he's saying is, just remember, anybody who follows me only needs me. That's the whole point of him saying, don't take anything. Oh, and by the way, you've got this exousia power. So you're good to go. He is Jehovah Jireh. What does that translate into roughly? God the provider. He's telling them, you can trust me, I'll provide. And so he sends them out. It says verse 10. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. Here's the next part of it, okay? If number one, oh, I should have told you. So the way I kind of broke this down was verses eight and nine would be trust God. Trust God. Sounds reasonable. He's going to give you what you need. Just count on him. Now go and trust God. Number two. Number two, verse 10, and he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. He's capitalizing on the idea of hospitality. Because in those days, and in fact, in a lot of cultures, uh, not modern cultures like ours, hospitality is a big deal. You know, visitor, uh, travelers would come through a city and oftentimes a man who was there at the courtyard talking to his buddies would see this traveler and say, hey, do you have somewhere to stay tonight? And the person might be like, well, no, my family and I were kind of tired. And they'd be like, oh, come on over. And they'd bring him into their, into their house. And when a person brought you, brought your family in, here's what they said to you. I promise I'll take care of you. I promise I will meet your needs. I promise that I will um, keep you safe. This was sort of like the principle of hospitality in those days. And so what Jesus had just done is he said, I promise I will provide everything you need, now go. It's kind of like a, he spiritualized hospitality, but then he made it practical. He goes, okay, now go. Oh, whatever, it is that you, whatever it is that you get, however it is that you get it, just be cool with it. If they're going to serve you peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for dinner, hey, at least you got food, you know? <laughs> Don't be like, oh, they got some T-bones on the grill next door. I'm going next door. You say, I'm cool with these sandwiches. The idea is contentment, okay? So if you're going to trust in God's provision, be content with what he provides. That's kind of part two of all of this. Guys, again, we live in a culture where it's so easy to want, isn't it? So easy to want more. Oh, my, my goodness. So easy. This isn't good enough. I got to have more, whatever else. And the Lord teaches you and me, make it, a lifestyle. How do you make contentment a lifestyle? What does that look like? What does a lifestyle of contentment actually look like? And you know what I'm so sad to tell you guys? Don't look at me. If you want to know what a lifestyle of contentment looks like, I mean, I'm content a lot, but I'm discontent sometimes too. And I'm kind of bummed that I have to be that way. Not have to, choose to be that way. Jesus talks to all these people in Matthew chapter 6. He goes, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first. Look, here he says it. I'm your provider, ma'am. I'm the one who's sending you on a task. He goes, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I'm going to summarize in one sentence kind of where I went with this. Okay, look on the screen. Discontentment brings distraction. 
Hey, remember what Jesus just said. Seek first the kingdom. When we're discontent, guess what isn't first? The kingdom. Discontentment brings distraction. However, contentment brings action. What does it do? It keeps number one, number one. I don't have to worry about all this other stuff. So you know what I'm zipping right to? The stuff of the kingdom. So when we're discontent, we get distracted and we go all over the place. But when we're content, we're like, God, send me. Here I am. Send me. I'm going. And then he goes, okay, good. Because I got some power for you. Now take it and go. This is what the Lord desires of all of his, of all of his people. Verse 11. And if any place will not re receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So let's say you were one of those pious Jews. You're one of those old, holier than that. Well, you're one of the religious Jews. And if you went to nearby, you know, Lebanon or Syria or one of the countries nearby, when you came back into the Holy Land, you took off your sandals before you got to the, you know, over the border and you kind of did this. You got all the dirt off, you put them back on and you stepped in to the Holy Land. They didn't want to get any unholy dust on their holy nation. Um, in, in Matthew's account of this, okay, uh, Luke's account of this, it adds to, the two, uh, to what Jesus just said, this, okay? This will be on the screen. I want you to read it because it's actually very crucial. And I think, based on my research, I think this is in the original papyrus, the scrolls, you know? I don't know why it's not in the book of Mark, but I'll just go with it because they're the pros and I'm not. Anyway, Matthew chapter 10, verse 15. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Why is that so key? That's so key because what Jesus just did was say this. My message is absolute. There is no compromise there's no gray area. When a person receives the gospel message, they have one of two things they can do. They can accept it and they will have eternal life or they can reject it and they will have eternal death, which means hell. He says, so this is symbolic of get the unholy off then and get back to the things of holiness. Beloved, we are supposed to share. We are supposed to, you know, make ourselves available in I got to be careful when I say this, the unholy areas. But I think you understand contextually now what I mean. You do have to get in on them. But I just want to encourage you to this. You're there for a purpose. You're there to try to spread the holiness. You want the gospel message to be known. Now what they do with it, I mean, again, you guys, that's just got to be their call. But it should never be something that you draw away from, okay? you go after it. You go after it. And that's a, li that's a lifestyle that we're supposed to live. Let me close up here. We're, we're just about out of time. So verse 12 says this. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. Um, uh, metanoeo is the, is the word. It means basically a change of mind, a total flip. That's what repent is. And so what the Lord was basically saying was they knew what was expected of the people they ministered to. And that's a, something for Christians to remember now. Remember when you are sharing the gospel, when you are befriending, when you are loving people and trying to, to influence them and whatnot, you are looking for repentance on their part. You do want to switch. They're supposed to recognize that they are sinners. They're supposed to recognize that there is nothing in the world that's going to give them contentment. They're supposed to recognize that they'll go to hell if they don't receive Jesus. Now, you're going to put it in a really nice way, but you're still going to say it. And then you're going to try. You're going to pray. You're going to want to draw them in to flip a U-turn spiritually and give their lives over to the Lord. That's what, that's what he was doing. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Uh, my one-sentence translation to myself. Great things happen through God's people when they rely on God's power to carry out God's will.
Does that kind of sound like a good summary of what we've just read? Let me read it again. Great things happen through God's people when they rely upon God's power to carry out God's will. Amen? Let's pray.